Hey guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. Today's episode of the Drafting Table Talk, we talk a little bit about engineers and why they like so much to design all of their connections in a vacuum. We talk about uh, the importance of contracts and how it varies with parties. We talk a little bit about field measuring and, and, and layout and why it's important that uh, people use the right points and the right tools to get their layout done. We also talk about training and how crucial that is and uh, some of the the strategies and struggles that, that we run into. So uh, take a listen. And as always, it's super important to us if you hit those like and subscribe buttons. Uh, we, we kind of, you know, need to know who's watching and make sure that, you know, at least some people are watching. So if you got a moment, hit one of those buttons or, or leave us a comment asking us, you know, what it is that you'd like to hear from us. That way we can keep producing content for you that is of the quality that you hope for. And as always, we hope to see you back here on the Steel Forum. All right, so we're back. Uh, obviously, from the NASTC, it was it was about a month ago, um, but you know my, my memory of it is still strong. Uh, I hope yours is too. Okay. What would you think overall? I I enjoyed a lot of it as far as you know getting to meet meet a lot of people in the industry. You know, a lot of times we spend our time talking with detailers or just specifically fabricators. You know, our customers. Right. But getting to talk with erectors, fabricators that are outside of the realm that we usually work with, speaking with attorneys, project managers of different sorts of things, um, engineers, architects, that sort of thing. You know, we we tend to be cut off from designers a lot lately. We have to funnel our questions through the fabricator, and we don't get that direct contact so much anymore unless we've actually got a design engineer working for us. So it was nice to get a chance to actually speak with some of those people and kind of see where their heads are at on some of the issues that we deal with today. And, and where are their heads at? Like, what, what what's going on in that, <clears throat> what I assume is an empty cavern? <laughs> it, sometimes it did feel like an empty cavern, but... You know, we we had issues with a job recently as far as the connection design, and I think that you spoke with someone in, um, oh, why can't I think of the place that we were? Well, it, the venue that we had going on, it was Matt Bailey, and yeah, it, it, it was refreshing to speak to an engineer and actually hear competent things coming out of his mouth. You know, he understood that you have to deal with load paths and you know how how is this all going to be transferred throughout the building because a lot of the issues that we had were the connections were being designed in a vacuum so they're all being treated like these moment connections are at the tops of columns everything's flat everything's level there's nothing else framing in and it 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 was just a nightmare to deal with that job and to i, I began to feel like i was taking crazy pills because the customer was agreeing with him and, you know, it, it, we weren't getting any kind of backup, but to speak to a couple other engineers about it and kind of have all of their jaws sort of hit the floor. Like, are you serious? This is not at all acceptable as far as how you design connections and well, things like that. And kind of what you're talking about, right, is the fact that just because a node coming from one side, a beam framing into a column, that connection works, doesn't mean that it's going to work with all the other connections coming into the other sides. And not only, uh, my, my concern obviously is for the detailing side of it that, you know, you can't make it all fit together and be erectable, but just as much the other side of it, engineering wise, is uh, there are times when those things need to interact with each other and to really be considered, um, you know, one of the sessions I went to was called Kinked Connections, which I kind of imagined they were talking about literally kinked connections, but it wasn't. What he was talking about basically were those load paths that are non-concentric, so they don't go directly into the centers of pieces, you know, or the, the strong points of pieces. And one of the things that that, that session for me made me realize <clears throat> is that connections just aren't beams to columns and, and stuff like that. Things like hangers and, um, you know, stairs and all this other stuff that, that needs to connect, all of that connection design should really be considered more comprehensively as well. Yes. That was that was a lot of what I got from speaking with Matt Bailey as well, was, you know, you, you've got to be able to not just consider the, the shear load or the specific moment load, but how is that going to be transferred not only into the column, but all the way to the ground. How is that transferred into the foundation? What are the load paths that that is all going to take? 
just because you've added this moment connection to a beam doesn't mean it ends there. You may be transferring through a column to another beam, and it's actually going down the line before it actually gets down into that foundation where it's fully supported. And it, right. it, things and that we just didn't consider. And there's kind of a, a double-edged sword here, right? Because the more that we consider, the more questions that, that we raise, the less efficient we're being, uh, whereas a, a less you know, responsible or educated detailer when looking at this situation doesn't need to consider those additional things and, and thus can have a more competitive bid. Um, so it does, it does become a little bit of chasing your own tail with these things where at some point this building design is not our problem. Um, and that's, that's a tough kind of balance for us. Yeah. Is, is to both be responsible for, for the building overall and responsible for ourselves uh, as far as you know, being yeah. profitable. Where where it really becomes an issue for me though is where you the you have a connection design engineer who's designed these connections in a co in a total vacuum. So, you know, you've right. got a beam that's framing into the middle height of a column, and he's showing it at the top of a column. He's giving it a cap plate, and let's say it's an HSS column, and you've got diaphragm plates that need to wrap around. Well, his detail shows these diaphragm plates wrapping around like there's nothing else going to be there that causes any issue. And then, you know, reality sets in when you go to model this and you see, oh, well, I have three moment connections and they all hit each other. You know, it, it, it's hugely problematic. Well, and then and you've got to go back and ask them to design to, it again. Yeah, some, something that detailers need to consider when they're, they're quoting and, you know, I, I haven't quite figured out this balance yet of how to scope this connection design stuff because there's scoping it for a good connection design engineer and then scoping it for a bad one. And even, even the good ones, you know, do a lot of that, you know, all right, this is the generic connection, now apply it everywhere. Well, it doesn't work everywhere. And I, I think the difference isn't that they consider it in a vacuum. The difference between the good and the bad is that once I point out that, hey, there's conflicts, a good engineer can take it from there. They, they find the conflicts and they'll, they'll design it. Whereas the ones that we increasingly work with kind of want us, the detailer, to handhold them through, all right, well, what should this connection look like? And the problem that that really creates is that then we're trying to design a connection. We're drawing something and then we end up redrawing it because they didn't like it and they you know keep adding specifications to it. So we end up drawing the same connection three, four times when really what should have happened is once we said, hey, it doesn't work, it doesn't work because of these reasons, they need to take it from there and really figure out what's going on uh, and, and take a complete in-depth look at that node. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's something that I, I don't know if it's just born out of laziness to try to get the job done and off their table, but we ran into that several times on a project as well where if you don't, really look at the plans and you think oh these two beams frame together i'll create a shear connection well they are vertically upset from each other there was a one foot vertical offset and the connection he specified physically couldn't exist now it's not that nothing could be yeah, done it's it, just that that connection could not have happened and he didn't bother to look at the plans any more than this w18 frames into this w21 and i'm done here yeah. And the problem is almost as always the schedule, because a lot of, you know, the specifications now are requiring connection design to be submitted either with or before the detail drawings. And until you detail this stuff out, until you find all of these problems, you're not going to know what's going on. And what we found is best is let us detail it. Let us use our judgment that we've we've gleaned over the years to apply a connection over, you know, 99 percent of these cases and then correct us when we're wrong, you know, when, when we underload it, you know, upsize the bolts or whatever else, that's fine. We'll, we'll correct it and send it back. But give us that chance to go through because only a detailer is really going to understand all of the problems that are coming into this connection. And until it's fully drawn, you know, e even a really good detailer isn't going to spot those things from a, you know, bird's eye view. You've got to be into the nitty gritty of laying out every hole and every plate on that connection before you really find those problems. Right. 
So again, as always with detailing, it's a, it's a scheduling problem, and you know the faster we push these these schedules up, the more and more we run into these problems. And I really think designers should be reconsidering the specification that requires connection design be re completed before they'll review details. You know, even if you review it and you say, and we've seen a, you know good engineering firms do this. You know, hey, my review is is contingent on a successful review of your connection design details, then we can take that information and not fabricate the stuff that we know is a little bit dicey, that might be on the edge, that we don't have solid engineering data behind yet. And we can address that situation on our own with our customers, and then we can move on. Yep. Um, so one of the sessions that I attended was about erector safety. And I, I think it was really good for me um, and it kind of added a process into my head. We've been talking a lot about our, our, our checking processes. I think that we should be uh, and that we will be adding a, an entire separate process to kind of look through the plans, the model, and consider erector safety for everything. Um, outside of, you know, have we incorporated OSHA safety standards? Yes, we do that generally anyways. But there's stuff beyond that that we could really be considering uh, to try and make their lives easier. You know, ways to, to, to put in safety seats to make sure that connections can be erected easily and conveniently and that they, they completely understand that. Um, one of the things that they said in that session that I, I, I tended to kind of disagree with, and of course there's going to be disagreements from, from our perspective, is he said, all right, you know, you have these HVAC openings, you've got some beams that need to be located later or whatever else because the elevator hasn't been designed or whatever else he said don't put those on hold he said it's easier for me to move them later or to create some other detail and fix it later than it is for me to not be able to erect this entire bay of steel because you have those beams on hold and i don't really know if i agree with that like i i don't know what our customers would expect from us as far as, yeah, we know something is probably going to be wrong here and your erector is going to have to fix it. Because I feel like they're going to come after us at a back for exactly. a back charge if we release steel that's, that we know is going to be wrong. That's just given from the erector standpoint. The erector would rather fix it, but the erector also won't be bashful about issuing a charge for that time fixing it. And well, it's just and this particular erector said, hey, it's still going to be cheaper for you for me to fix this, because I'm going to charge you because that stuff was on hold anyways. And, but it did at least place in my mind that if this stuff is on hold, what are our procedures to make sure that our customers are aware of it and that they're passing that on? Because once we place it on hold, we kind of, or as it is, we kind of consider that out of our hands. Listen, we've asked this question twice, and that's usually what it is. We've asked this question twice. It still hasn't been answered, so we have to put this stuff on hold. We can't release it for fabrication. Right. We cloud it on approval. Um, it gets ignored. We issue an RFI after it's been ignored and it's come back. We don't get an answer. We have to put something in for fabrication, so we issue the rest of the building, and we just mark it on hold. I, I have to wonder if it would be a better idea to, instead of just marking it on hold and setting it aside to getting a conversation going with the fabricator and the erector to say, what is it you guys really want to do here? Because from our standpoint, I don't care. I just need to do something. If it's mark it on hold, if it's put part of it on hold. Right. And I would much rather not mark right. it on hold because marking it on hold means I've got to come exactly. back to this later. It's going to be a rush. It's going to be somebody's going to have to drop whatever they're doing to come back and deal with this. Where it's, I would love to handle it right now, get it out of the way, you know, maybe we ship the beam long, leave the clip angles off, field weld, whatever, right. uh, but that, that should really yeah. come and into it. And I feel it. if we had the conversation up front, then once you're out in front of it, then it's already in the erector's and the fabricator's mind that this needs to be dealt with, what do we do? And now they're not looking at us as... A, you're delaying the job by keeping these members on hold, and B, you did it wrong because you took a guess when you didn't have the information. You know, we kind of get caught in that rock in a hard place thing, but if if we had that discussion up front with them, that might be a great way to 
get them to solve the problem for us, or at the very least, they come up with a solution that doesn't result in us getting beat up either way. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I think that's something we should probably roll into our procedures. And that's the thing kind of with a, with a detailing firm, you know, we've, we've been at it for about five years and there's still so much stuff. Six now. Six years. All right. Six years. Um, and I mean, we were detailers for 15 years before that, at least I was, and there's still all of that stuff that, that we're still trying to figure out what the best way to handle it is. Um, it, part of that, of course, is that the, the industry changes constantly. And, but part of it is that you just need to keep improving. I, I, I'm sure there's a perfect detailing firm out there who charges, you know, next to nothing for their details. Uh, but it's, it, it's not us yet. It's, uh, I'm still waiting for the button that the, the GC thinks that we can press right. to produce the new details. Oh, yeah, just spit out some new, for, for some tomorrow. new details for me, would you? I'm going to think my dog's yeah. about to flip <laughs> out. I guess they're going to manage to contain themselves. Nice. <clears throat> nice. Um... So that actually kind of brings me to the stair that uh, I've kind of been working on on my own. It's one of those kind of side projects where it's it, it needs that one person involved in it who kind of understands all of the vagaries about it because the contract drawings are completely nonsense. Like it's it's straight up just an interior designer's idea of what a stair might look like and uh, some some engineering data to back it up, and it's. In the end, the customer just needs a stair to go from this level to this that level and looks like this, right? Um, but the problem that we ran into recently, one of the things that, you know, that I wanted to talk about was the, the bad layout in the field and kind of what it caused and how it could have been avoided. Um, so what happened was they built a stud wall and the stud wall was on you know, a bevel. It's supposed to butt up to this stair. And so they let, you know, Joe Gomer, who's put the, the walls up, put this wall up. And to be fair to, to Joe Gomer, his job was just to build a stud wall that's about at this angle. And that's what he did, right? And then what they did after that is they took and they laid the rest of this stair out based on that field condition. So now they have a $300 stud wall and it's costing thousands of dollars to revise this stair to match that stud wall instead of laying it out properly in the first place now i have to go and revise all of these stair deeds and this is not just a straight stair every stair is on a different angle it's custom with underslung stringers the whole bit right and they're on a skew and, not know, only to each other that the stringers aren't parallel but they're also not square to the stair treads themselves to the treads right right and you know, so I, I, I work it up. I put together a proposal for the change order. Hey, to, to change these drawings based on field conditions is X. And the GC, of course, right, just like every other person that's in the field, just assumes that if I need to change my drawings because it doesn't match the measurements, it's because my drawings were wrong. So I had to go through that whole process of, process of explaining to him, hey, no, my drawings were correct based on the design. I understand that your field conditions don't match the design, but that's not my fault. Like, and the, the worst part is, is that I told them specifically, don't make me produce the details, the fabrication details for these stairs until we have the field measurements and this thing laid out because it's not going to match. They said, we want, it. we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it, we want it now. Okay, here it is. Here's your stair details. Okay, we've laid it out and none of our dimensions match what's on your drawings. Okay, now I have to redetail this whole thing again. Right. Here's well, your invoice. Well, why should I have to pay for this? It, w it was worse than what? that too because they basically came back and said, we, we have a three, four, six right triangle. Why can't you yeah. do drawings? Yeah. We, we've created yeah. a three, four, six right triangle in the field. No, you didn't. And you wound up spending time. I believe what you described to me was you wound up 
doing a video call in the field to them where they kind of led you oh, through. Yeah. The, the, Tell me about that. The guy added me as a friend on Facebook and video called me through Facebook, right? Because his corporate whatever wouldn't allow him to set up Zoom on his computer or whatever else. So he's literally walking me through the building with his camera phone pointed at the lines that they've drawn on the floor. And I'm explaining to him, okay, you laid that line based off of this point, but you shouldn't have used this point. You should have used that and then laid it out this way. You can't take a, you know, 12 inch bevel and strike a 35 foot line and have it be parallel. It's not going to work. You know, that if, if you're off even a half degree, you're off by a foot by the end of that line. Like you have to do these things. And in the end, I figured out what they'd done wrong and all that stuff to kind of produce a stare. And basically how it works is there's three stairs that wrap around. It's kind of like a really wide spiral type thing but so what i said is produce the bottom stair right produce the top stair put them in place and then we'll field measure them and then we'll build the second stair to attach the two because then it's it's fine everything's going to work out okay right i can make those those things fit together no 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 we want to produce it all and you know the the erector the guy who who did the layout on the floor with chalk lines is so confident in his field measurements or his layout that he doesn't want, he doesn't think that we need to do field measurements once it's actually in the air with steel. Again, okay, you're writing the checks, but this is a bad idea. And I, I always struggle with that, right? Like, I've tried to help you help yourself. It's like, you know, from Jerry Maguire, help me help you. And you no, know, we want to go forward, we want to move forward, and here we are. <sighs> So, as long as they keep writing the checks, I guess it can be your full time job for a few more months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And those those GCs are. It's it's funny too because we keep because we're working directly for a GC. We keep getting these requests. Okay, can you provide us your insur insurance certificate? No. Okay, can you provide us your AIA billing request? No. I'm not going to do any of those things. And you know, for your detailers out there. If you are quoting direct to a GC, make sure that your terms are complete and that they include things like, I don't maintain insurance and, hey, I'm not doing monthly billing on AIA forms with three forms and triplicate and all that stuff. Here's how I bill and here's how you pay. Uh, because several times they've come back to us and like they're like, you know, we're six months into the job. The job's basically done. And their paper pusher is like, oh, here's your PO. I need you to sign this and return it to me. No, we already have a signed contract. I'm not signing it. Well, you have to sign it. It's in my checklist here. No, I I'm not going to sign it. Well, you have to. All right. I'll sign it if you take out this condition, this condition, this condition, this condition, this condition, and add all these other basically conditions. Basically turn in. it back into the contract they've already signed with us. Yeah. Exactly. And you, you gotta, you gotta be stalwart on those things because if you let them dictate the contract terms to, especially when you are, we already have a contract. We wouldn't have started the job if they hadn't signed off on our proposal in the first place. We have a signed contract. I don't need anything else from you. If you need something else, it's on you to make that fit into the contract that we already have. I am not over the barrel. You are. And I will absolutely, if you don't send me that check, I will just stop doing what I'm doing. Right. The, and we'll the wait. moment that you st refuse to pay, you have now breached the contract that we actually do have. So we're done working. Right. Right. And that, too, is included in our contract right. that if, if you don't pay and you basically say, you know, it, it's not we don't do it on day one that you're late, but. Once we get the impression, basically, through writing or through bad behavior or whatever else, lack of communication usually is what does it about payment, um, right. that we're not going to get our money in a reasonable manner, I am fully entitled by our contract to stop work, and we will start it up again, not when you write the check, but when, once you write the check, and we can get back to it. Right. You've lost your place in the schedule. And, and I think that's something worth pointing out, too, because we do talk about this a lot as far as, 
you know, going after our money and, and liens and things like that. I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression. This isn't, you know, hey, your check is three days late. This is 30 to 60, maybe 90 days past due. And we've substantially completed more of the project, and we're just looking to get that first bill, that anchor bolts for approval or, you know, the, the original OFA billing in. The job is half standing at this yeah. point, and now they want some roof frames from us, and they haven't paid us in three months. That That's what I'm talking yeah. about when, when we get to that point. Right. And not only have they not paid us, and, and this is what I talk a lot about our customers too, is it's not just about non-payment. It's about failure to communicate about your non-payment. Right. It's just like if you call a detailer and they're not answering the phone about when you're going to get your drawings, you know, that scares you a lot more than being a little bit behind schedule. It's the same thing with, with, with payment. You know, listen, I never like to hear that we haven't been paid because you haven't been paid. That's, that's not acceptable to us, blah, 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 whatever. But we understand the realities of some of these situations. Is If you're working on getting us a check in a somewhat reasonable manner, we're going to continue to be reasonable. We can't, in this industry, do otherwise. And it's, it's, it's usually a, a tough conversation for me to have because I don't want them to, give, to get the impression that pay us whenever you want to pay us. But on the other hand, we're not going to stomp up and down and, and, and flail our arms or anything. It's, you know, we, we want to feel like you're working your best to pay us and that we have a reasonable expectation of being paid. Yep. We also have gone into the whole, I, I love this phrase when it's thrown at us, hostage situation. People say, oh, you're holding my drawings oh, yeah. hostage. Well, drawings I hostage, performed yeah. work. You haven't paid for that work you're actually holding my money hostage demanding more work from me it, it you, you've got it backwards yeah you know and and a lot yeah. of this is is stuff that reminds me of one of the sessions that i was in um it was the you know don't i did i did so many legal ones but i know one of them was don't bet the company mistakes and there were some other legal ones as far as how to write your contract and things like that and I, I spoke with one of the attorneys afterwards. I have to get his name. We'll, we'll throw it in the link. But we've got them to agree. We, we've got to get a video together doing a, a shoot with them just to kind of ask them some questions about that because writing the contract is so important for so many reasons. I, you're hoping to never wind up in the litigation or even arbitration, mediation sort of a, a standpoint. But when you can actually discuss some of your terms with the fabricator up front and you're negotiating that, that has a whole conversation all by itself that really does help smooth over a lot of issues before they happen. You know, wh yeah. what, are, what yeah. are the terms, what are the issues that I'm already foreseeing happen? And a lot of the things you foresee happening, you're going to put in your exclusions. So those are things that you want to discuss with the customer up front at bid time Say, these are the things I am not going to cover. You need to be sure that you're aware of that and that you're dealing with it one way or the other. Be it, you know, I don't carry insurance, something as simple as that. Or, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this thing that you have in your scope because it's not structural or miscellaneous metals, but for some reason you've included it in your scope. Just be aware you're not getting those drawings from me based on this quote. Now, if you need that, then we go back to the negotiating table and see if it's something we can, in fact, provide. But it's not being provided for based on this, you know, price from us at this point in time. Yeah, there's a tendency, particularly of younger in the sense of the age of the company, detailing firms to think of every project they're given, every contract, every purchase order as a gift. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, they don't want to do anything to jeopardize it and you, you, you can't you just can't think like that you need to think of this contract as a way of communicating with your customer what your expectations are and what they should expect of you just as much so that at the end of the day not only are are they prepared for it but you know that you've communicated with them those expectations. Yeah. So one of the most important things about those contracts is that communication. And, and, and too many people are afraid of that. One of the things that scares me the most 
is when I send a customer our proposal, you know, they've agreed to it. I'm like, all right, well, sign it and, and return it. And they do that instantaneously. I'm like, please, please read it and understand it. There's, there's nothing in there that I'm afraid of you reading. I'm not trying to hide anything in there. It's a very short contract. It's a page of, you know, not huge type, but it's basically, it, it covers the basics of our relationship. When do I expect to be paid? What's going to happen if you don't pay me? What happens if there's a mistake? You know, how do I, how do I handle that? And there's a bunch of stuff. You can have a conversation outside of that about, you know, what, how you're going to behave, but your, your legal expectations really need to be clear in there. Right. And it gives you something to negotiate and discuss later on in the job if issues do arise. Because what you don't want to wind up with is actually going to court. Because our projects are not worth that much money. And as soon as you have to involve a lawyer, you know, you can't just write it into your contract where... You know, the, the customer has to pay for your attorney's fees if there's a dispute. There, there's there's no way to really do that. So, yeah, you know, if you are going to get shafted out of a couple thousand dollars, well, it may cost you tens of thousands of dollars to hire an attorney to try to recover that money. So, you know, is it really yeah, worth it? So it, it gives you something to kind of discuss and negotiate over. Sometimes... Uh, one of the things that we were talking about in one of the sessions was doing mediation prior to getting to litigation. If you can do mediation, that's really just somebody who is, you know, a, a disinterested third party, essentially. And they're unbiased and they'll listen to both sides and kind of give their perspective thoughts on everything. And if you can reach an agreement through them, it's a lot less costly than going through the court system and having to deal with lawyers and judges and all that stuff. And even if you spend the money, go after them in court, they could still just refuse to pay you. I mean, it's, it can be very challenging to get paid on a job and you may have done nothing wrong, but if you don't have the, the initial skills to just discuss, negotiate and try to settle these things between you know yourself and your customer then it's it's a very expensive road to go to try to recover a little bit of money yeah well and that's why too like for us our our proverbial ace in the hole really is the four fabrication drawings and until i've been paid or have a reasonable expectation of being paid for those approval drawings for that for us, that's, that takes us up to 80% of the billing. I, I'm sorry, but you're just not getting the fabrication drawings. It's not personal. It's not a battle. We're not holding it hostage. We've done X amount of work. You need to pay us for it. And the, the approval schedule is almost, such, uh, almost always such that by the time we have those back and we should be releasing them for fabrication, we should have been paid for the approval drawings. Uh, and that's why we use 15 day terms. It's not that we need to have that money in 15 days. It's that we want the expectation of being paid before we're ever going to release those fabrication drawings. So that even in the worst case, what we're up against being shafted on is 20% of the job. Um, and, you know, obviously we do other stuff. We, we, we protect ourselves by pre-leaning um, and by, by sending letters of intent, that type of stuff so that we're protected in other cases. But even those, is, as much as it's a shield and it's gonna get you paid in most cases, uh, we're going through a case right now where we just have a lien on their building now and the owner of the building is seemingly okay with that. Um, so, you know, it's an encumbrance and later, you know, eventually, yeah, that's probably gonna work out in our favor. But for now, we don't have the money when we should. So one of the other things that, that I went and saw was how to train detailers. And that was sort of a big one for me because we've experienced some growth this year. And it's been challenging for us because you want to hire somebody who has experience if you can find them. The problem is finding them. That, that market is difficult to get anything out of because good detailers are well-employed. 
you know, it, it's it's not challenging for a detailer to move around wherever they want to go if they want to go somewhere. So we've been trying to find experienced detailers for years, and it's always been a, a challenge. So the alternative is hiring somebody new and having to teach them from the ground up. And the problems that you encounter with that are that you're already doing the technical work of the business. If, if you're a small detailing company, you're already doing the detailing. So if you're going to bring in somebody who doesn't know how to do anything, you have to stop what you're doing and then teach. How do you go about doing that? Because you still have to keep the lights on and pay the bills, and now you have to pay this new employee. So you have to right. pay them when they're not quite as productive as you need them to be. And you have to stop being productive yourself so you can teach them. Now, it is a long-term solution. As you train them, they become useful and you make that money back. But it's a real struggle in the beginning. And especially, you know, a lot of people make the decision to hire because they're flooded with work. Well, if you're already flooded with work, how do you stop working to train somebody? It, it's yeah. And it's been, you, it's you been a challenge for us this year. And it's something that... I, I picked up a few good ideas. One of the things I really enjoyed was the, the lunch and learn that they discussed was, you know, you, you have an hour lunch, so 30 minutes of it, you're eating your lunch, but another 30 minutes, you're teaching a little bit, you know, do a little bit of training, kind of every day or every week, try to build them up a little bit better so that they are getting that consistent training and you're not just throwing them to the wolves of, you know, here, try this, see if you can figure it out, and then I'm going to mark it all up and bloody it and give it back to you and let you do it over again. If you can actually get some of that well, training, that's, that's very helpful in trying to grow a detailer from a seed, basically. Yeah, that's... Uh, and it, everybody needs it, right? Like, everybody needs additional training. That's one thing the NASCC will always reinforce, is no matter how much you think you know, you don't know nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's always somebody doing more, doing it better, doing it harder. And that's one of the things, like, even when we hire experienced people, whether it's a, an employee or a subcontract, checker, detailer, whatever else, is the experience that we have and the experience that they have is not always going to be the same. It's almost never the same. Um, you know, we've we've hired subcontract checkers before and they get through a project, you know, they, they say it's checked and we pull it off the board and just start looking through it and boom, here's five things that we would have noticed that this checker didn't. Doesn't mean that they're not, I, I guess with a checker, it does mean that they're not qualified. <laughs> um, but with a detailer, that's not necessarily true. Like a good detailer still makes mistakes or, you know, would do things differently than we do. And that's... Uh, uh, another thing for us to struggle, you know, particularly with, with new employees, uh, you know, especially highly compensated ones is the, okay, but they're still not going to be perfect. Like they're still going to have to learn your way of doing things, depending on where they came from, what industry, you know, if they've been working for a fabricator, they've been doing things the way that fabricator likes and things that may not be acceptable to your customers. So it's, it's a big, big transition. For, for right. anybody. And when you're hiring, this, this is something that we've kind of gone through a little bit before, is when you're hiring a, a person who's worked in-house for a single fabricator for a long period of time, they're going to have to go through that same learning curve that we did when we first started out because we grew up working in-house for a fabricator. So you start meeting other fabricators and your ideas are going to clash. How do you level columns? How do you design your connections, bolted versus welded, single versus multiple clip ang or, you know, pairs of clip angles? We have had arguments with customers over the, the stupidest of connections because to their mind, it's the only way anyone would ever do this. And to our mind, this is the stupidest connection I have ever seen. Why would you ever do this? And vice versa. So, you know, it, right, right. It's and sometimes they change our minds, sometimes we change their minds and and there's a whole, you know, growth for everyone, but it it goes back to that whole negotiation. You've got to talk about these things up front, and that's been a huge learning curve for us. And it it's a learning curve when we hire employees. Is you know, even if you're experienced, if you've got 10, 20 years experience, it it's 
if you have it worked in all of the different regions with all the different fabricators that we have, then you don't have that same experience. And of course they don't, you know, it's, it, there's always going to be, right. I mean, and they've worked with ones that we haven't. So they have other ideas that they bring to the table. So it's always important to talk because they can learn from you and you can learn from them. You know, how would you go about doing this? So maybe they have a solution to something that's just, we've been beating our heads against it for years and, you know, we just accept that it doesn't work and maybe they have another option. So it's always important to value their input as well, but you have to kind of take it as a whole roll it in with what you already know and then decide what's the best way forward and move on from there. Yeah. And, you know, as, as the owner of a detailing firm, you, I am constantly terrified of something going wrong. Right. And so I have difficulty trusting any of my employees to put out anything. And I mean, yeah, that that's a good paranoia to have, but also it, it, it prevents us from growing past the point where I can look at things and we just can't allow that. Right. Like at some point we need to either train our guys to the point where I'm comfortable with, with sending stuff out. Um, and that's kind of an ebb and flow thing where like they, you know, you, you, you push too hard for speed and then you lose quality and vice versa. Uh, but also, on the other hand, you can give people, and we've seen this before, you can give people all the time in the world, and the quality that comes out is still terrible. Um, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot to that. Um, but one of the things that I think we do well is that we're not, we, we don't look for blame, we look for ways to improve. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are some employees who just are irredeemable. They're never going to be what you need them to be or, or, or to be profitable. Those, those people obviously exist. Um, but on the other hand, there are, there are great detailers out there right now, I'm sure, who are listening to this, who have just been beaten down by people who, every time they make a mistake, treat it as a, a character flaw instead of a mistake that needs to be addressed. Yeah, we, we went through a lot of that when we were coming up in the fabrication shop. Because the, the standard mantra there was, if it doesn't fit, it was drawn wrong. Which, yeah. overwhelmingly, yeah. you know, at, at one point you got ticked off enough that you just went out in the shop and started checking everything and decided that they had actually a 100% failure rate. There wasn't one single member that they pretty... produced that was perfectly according to the drawings. Or even close. Yeah. And no, that's not an exaggeration. No, yeah. it, was, it was actually 100%. that bad, but... I, yeah. I still remember was, getting the phone call a, from one of the field guys on that school that you you had checked as much as you possibly could, and we were tracking it through the model. So every every day you went out... Now, and we're talking checking the fabrication, not right, the shop right. drawings. You had gone out and actually checked the fabrication, and you were just trying to bring some quality control to it. I remember how it started was you were going to go out and check 5 or 10% of the work, but... The first thing you checked was wrong. The second thing you checked was wrong. And then you just started to go until, can I find anything right? And you never did. So <laughs> so I got a call from the erector. And the nice thing was every day on lunch, you would come back up from the shop and hand me a list. The, Matt, these are all the members I checked today. So I was ticking them off in the, in the model. So I had sort of a color coding custom property so I could see what was checked, what was not. And there were a couple beams that slipped through the cracks. And he calls me up and he says, hey, you know, this 37B4, it's, it doesn't fit. And I checked the model. I go, yeah, that's one they slipped through on Nick. Ah, oh, you've got to be kidding me. The job was going so smooth till then. You know, it's that, it's that quality yeah. control. You just, I don't know. <laughs> Some people just don't have it. Yeah, we got we you know we got an email from one of our customers, good customer, um, but it listed like it was like the, these four things were wrong in, in the field, and can you look into it? And right away, that the four things I can't remember what they were, but the four things were very obviously this is going to be shop error. Like a beam was too short by a couple inches, um, you know these the clip angles weren't aligned right. That stuff where you know what we're, we're modern competent detailers using a, a three D. That's not the stuff that's going to go wrong. Yeah, stuff goes wrong, but that's not going to be it. And, you know, they're like, oh, can you look into this? And 
it, it, it never seems to change that once I point out that it wasn't anything that we did wrong, there's still this feeling in them that, well, you guys must have done something wrong because it didn't fit together. Even when we demonstrate with, you know, real data that it, this is not something that we did wrong, it, they, they still believe it. Yeah, we actually had payment withheld on us over a job like that a few years ago. And we just let it go because we just didn't want to have the argument. We were kind of done with them as a customer because we had gotten a lot of grief for them for this job. And what was it? Four or five months later, we got the check sent to us and an apology from the project manager. Yeah, it turns out we fabricated all that steel wrong. Yep. You know, and it was it was different when we worked in house for the fabricator because we were there. So when we got accused of doing something wrong, you walk down the stairs, out into the shop, you measured it, and you show them where they did something boneheaded. Well, when they're yeah. three, you know, three states away, you got to take their word for it. There's nothing. I mean, you can try to walk them through. Hey, take these measurements. What did you get here? See how this doesn't work. But sometimes you get the hard-headed ones that just say, "No, it's just wrong," and I'm not going to do anything to try to help you figure out why. Yeah, yeah. The amount of times I've been attempted or tempted to just get into a car and drive over there with a T square and a you know tape measure, just no. See, like this is wrong. Um, it's a lot. There's there's a lot of the times. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I, I think we should wrap up. I, we should probably do another episode on the NASCC because I, I really want to talk about the industry roundtable and some of the stuff we talked about there. Uh, but I don't want to draw out too long. I want to make sure that we get this one up and posted um, and continue continue the conversation. So any, anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? No, I got nothing. I think I need to go back and take a look at the videos we've already posted on the NASCC just to kind of get that refresher. Yeah, yeah, okay. Something about wings. All right, guys, that was it for our kind of NASCC roundup Part one, we're going to continue to uh, talk about, there's so much to talk about when you go to one of these conferences. Conferences, We did some discussions those days, but after you have time to process it and, and apply it in the real world, your your vision of some of it changes. Um, so we'll, we'll have another episode recorded here soon, and we hope you'll keep joining us here on the Steel Forum. One more thing uh, we, we mentioned in this video and uh, a couple other times that we have done some hiring. We've, we've gotten some, brought some more people on. We're expanding. And that means we're looking for new customers. So if you happen to be out there, you're running a detailing uh, department or for a fabricator or for, for whoever else, then you happen to need some contract detailing, please reach out to us. Our website is down in the video description. And uh, if you got any questions, please feel free, reach out, give us a call, drop us an email. We'll be happy to help you out.